Hi guys, Valentina here, ValentinaPetrovaConsulting.com and somehow I get stuck answering the relationship questions again. I get asked by my friends, I get emails, I get clients who read something, a book, an article, saw something on TV and run over to me and want to know more. So what do they want to know these days? So how about polyamory, open relationship and swinging? How's how are they different? How are they the same? If they're the same, what's the story? So that's a conversation that you would hear often among millennials who are very curious about that. They seem to live in a different paradigm than their parents or even their grandparents. So they feel a little bit more free to experiment with relationship styles. Uh, but also people my generation, Generation X, uh, and even older folks are curious about these things because not just because they hear about them, but they might be questioning their own situations and wondering what's possible and what's available and if it is for them. So hopefully this short video will be helpful for you guys to figure these things out. And I strongly encourage you to do some more research and talk to some people who are from these lifestyles so you can hear directly from them um, the challenges and the benefits of each. But just like a little primer for you here, um, just a little information. So starting with polyamory, polyamory is the ability to love many people in a romantic kind of a setting. Uh, we're used to a coupleship and whether it's same sex or opposite sex or whatever goes on these days, but usually it's two people is sort of the traditional thing is where evolutionary created I say built to create pair bonds so we can raise our offsprings you know there's stability um, into a situation because human babies are very needy and it's always better to do it with someone else <laughs> right if you're a single parent you know what I mean it's always better to do it with someone else so polyamory is more than just two people in a relationship in a romantic arrangement and what that looks like depends depends on the people involved are there three are there four uh, with the increased number of people you increase complexity in the relationship how stable is that relationship or what is involved um, again that depends on the people involved but there is one thing that's absolutely necessary and that is everyone involved is there by consent and fully aware of everybody else. <laughs> it's not, there are no secrets. There are no dark corners that you don't tell the new person you just met that you're already in a relationship and they find out two months down the road that, oh, I'm not the only one. What? <laughs> Same thing, like you don't forget to tell your main partner that you met someone else and now you're hanging out with them. That would be considered an affair. If there's secrecy, that's the definition of an affair is when there's secrecy. Um, that's the part that hurts because when people find out that they didn't know everything and the information was not up front, they were not consulted in the matter, they didn't give their consent, they feel betrayed. And that's really what hurts in affairs. So in a polyamorous relationship, everything is on the open up. Everybody is giving consent. Everybody knows everybody else. To whatever degree they want to be known and however the configuration there decides to work it out. Some people live together. More than two people live together. Three, four, five people live together. You get more than five, I guess you get a commune. <laughs> but there's, there are benefits to having more than one person by your side. And most people think about the sexual advantages. It's like, ooh, all the fun I can have, you know. Maybe we can have lots of threesomes every night. Or I just have a different person every night or something. So they, people think about the sexual advantages. But there are other advantages to polyamorous relationships. And especially when people live together and they're stable relationships. It's that you share the burden of living, you know. You're all paying the rent or the mortgage. You're sharing the chores. You're raising the kids. Uh, there's always someone there that you can talk to. It's kind of like an extended family, right? But those things are complicated because people have feelings and people's feelings get hurt. 
for whatever reason, you know, we get attached to each other, especially when we're swapping hormones and we're having sex with each other, inevitably we get attached. That's how it is. That's how nature made us to build the pair bond <laughs> so that we can raise our offspring. So even though we're maybe not having sex to have kids, we're still swapping hormones and we're still getting attached. And when we get attached, we get jealous. You know, we want the same amount of attention as the other person is getting or more to feel more secure. And so there are some pitfalls in there. And sometimes people get ticked off when their partner meets someone else and they're all excited about that person. Even though everything is on the open up, the new relationship energy may be tough on you um, or on your partner if you're the one that just met someone. So this is the reality of polyamory. It's complicated. There are benefits to it. It may or may not be for everyone. But the important thing is that everyone is on the same page. People know what's going on and everything is up front. Usually it starts with a monogamous couple that opens up. Even if people identify as polyamorous, when they first meet and make a couple, the successful ones seem to start out as monogamous relationships, work out their own kinks within their own particular dynamic, build enough trust within that particular duo, and then open up to others and folding them into their experiences. And how much of that really, again, depends on that couple. It's very difficult if um, you're, so you're polyamorous and then right from the start, you just like go for it. Um, you might end up being the third wheel on another relationship sometimes, which is fine if that's how it starts, it's how it starts. The trust is the main thing. So how do you maintain the trust when the number of people increases and the complexity increases? How do you make sure that everyone is satisfied emotionally and otherwise and feels fairness in the relationship? So you have to be very considerate have to be very conscientious and you have to work hard to maintain those relationships. If you feel that just having one other person in your life is too much work, uh, that's what happens when you have more people in your life too. You have to maintain them too. And some couples decide that uh, polyamory is sort of a polyamory, not really a polyamory or like Dan Savage will call it monogamish relationship. Maybe they just date other people once in a while, but it's the consent of the two primary individuals. They know each other. They talk about it. I, you know, my partner knows that on Friday I'm going to hang out with some other guy. And I know that on Thursday he's going to hang out with somebody else and how they work out the arrangement. So it's equitable for both sides. It's up to them, but it's a conversation and it has to happen or else the whole thing goes down. So that's polyamory, loving more than one person. And so what's, that, what's the difference between that and open relationship? Well, an open relationship is usually a, a couple who have agreed to have extracurricular activities, right? Outside of the main bond, outside of the main relationship. And they have defined the parameters of that. So um, whatever that is, some people want to know everything about what their partner is doing. Others don't want to know anything. They just want to know where they are and how to reach them in a case of emergency. But usually, again, it's with the consent with the other person. You can't have an open relationship and, and have secrets because that leads to betrayal and that leads to jealousy and all kinds of other stuff. Um, so open relationship is just one main relationship and other people are just sort of like meteors coming and going on the night sky, <laughs> short lived little things and maybe some, um, a little prolonged, um, outside relationships, but it's with the clear consent of the main partner and they don't all hang out together necessarily. Um, then a polyamorous relationship can be an open relationship or not an open relationship. Let's say you have four people in the unit and they're not open to anybody else. It's like, this is it. There's four of us. We're going to make it work, right? Or three of us. We're going to make it work. It's not open to anybody else and you can't go fuck around outside of that unit. Or that polyamorous relationship can be open. It's like, okay, there's two or three of us 
and we're hanging out and this is us, but we give each other the freedom to do these other things outside. It's up to the people involved to define the parameters of these relationships. So there are some similarities, obviously, and some kind of overlap between these types of relationship structures. And the biggest overlap is freedom. You know, how much freedom do you have? How much freedom do you give each other? And the other overlap is trust. You know, how much do you trust everybody else to give them the freedom? Um, and I'm willing to put up with the consequences, right? So uh, then what about swingers? How are swingers different from polyamorous bunch? Well, swingers are usually a couple that goes out together and has some kind of a fun experience together. Maybe they're voyeurs or maybe they actively participate in swapping other partners. So they meet other couples and swap with each other <laughs> for the night or for the weekend. <laughs> they're all there and hang out together. They can be a swingers cruise where sort of like the implied consent that everybody's swapping with everybody or a swingers vacation to Mexico. There are resorts down there where these things happen and it's for couples only and you have to behave in certain ways. You can't be a dick or an ass. You have to uh, consider the person you like their partner and are they okay with it and it has to be intelligent adult play right it's not just free for all and slobber all over everybody and make a mess out of it um, so the swinger community is um, more restricted I would say than what you would think of an open relationship polyamorous type of arrangement um, but yes, there is variety in there, so people find that interesting, enticing, and for a lot of people, it saves their marriages, really, because for whatever reason, um, maybe people value each other in other ways and never, never, never want to live without each other, but there's this sexual aspect that they can't fulfill for each other, so or curiosity or variety that they need. So as a couple, they decide and they participate in these swinging types of arrangements where they can live off of fantasy for the weekend or, um, you know, play with some fetishes or whatever they want to do or play as a couple with another couple. Um, so that's your short and sweet explanation of these three relationship structures. Um, the thing I want you to go home with is that you can't act as a free agent when you are in a relationship. Even though in a way you're a free agent, you have to consider your partner. Whatever great ideas for fun you have must be approved by your partner. And expect, no matter what situation you're in, expect some degree of jealousy. Some people are more jealous than others, so they will never, ever be able to sustain that kind of a trial, that kind of a experiment, but other people are less jealous, but nevertheless, there is a degree of jealousy that arises and it's natural. Um, again, evolutionary development brings us to this point, but maybe just like aggression, whenever we feel angry, we don't act aggressively. If we're civilized and have self-control, we can talk ourselves out of stupid aggressive actions that we'll regret forever. We can do the same with jealousy. So you have some jealousy, but your rational side kicks in and you stand on the foundation of the trust you have with this person, with your partner, to know that even though they're having fun and you're feeling that emotional jealousy, it's still okay. And they're happy and they'll come home to you and they'll tell you what's up if you want them to. And you are still that same strong couple. So you need the trust to combat the jealousy and you need your rational capacity to talk yourself out of stupid actions and ruining a good arrangement. It's easy when you are in a in a polyamorous relationship or a swing kind of relationship or like a monogamous relationship, if you're on the receiving end of benefits, you are the one that met someone and you're very excited, it's very easy to lose sight of 
what your partner might feel like and um, reassure them, you know? So if you're the one that is left behind, you're the one that might feel jealous. Some people in the polyamorous community say that they're happy for their partner. So wouldn't that be an awesome thing if we can all evolve to the point where we can be happy when our partners are happy, <laughs> right? <laughs> Especially when they're happy in bed with someone else. <laughs> so something to strive to, right? To be bigger humans, perhaps not to be so territorial, but we are who we are, so expect some jealousy. And if you can't handle it, then you can't handle those types of arrangements. And you need to be upfront about it. And you need to be talking to your partner about it, that you're not okay with it. And if they're not willing to quit what they're doing for your sake, then you have a problem. So, and if you are the person that's not willing to quit for your partner's sake, then you have a problem too. <laughs> <laughs> so that's your skinny on these different types of relationships and hopefully that's helpful and again look up some um, resources there's plenty on the internet about different things there are forums where people discuss these things and the best thing is to talk to folks who are in that lifestyle and see how they're handling it and what's working for them what's not working for them and remember all these arrangements are very unique you can't easily um, put a pattern on the whole thing like it really depends on the people involved and how they play it out and I have seen folks that consider themselves polyamorous that are wrecking their lives and the lives of others and are using other people for selfish gain and they're just being assholes basically and it's sad and then I have seen people who are in that lifestyle swingers or polyamorous folks that are very conscientious they're great communicators they're actually an example of what human relationships should be because they're so um, in touch with themselves and concerned about everyone's well-being and that's what makes it work really so anyways if you have any questions shoot me a comment down below this video or send me an email valentinapetrovaconsulting.com and I'll be happy to entertain your questions it's always fun to experiment um, out there, but be wise, be smart, and don't rashly go into anything. Practice some impulse control <laughs> and use your mind. <laughs> All right, I hope you have a nice day and I'll talk to you next time. Bye.